we are in a situation where uh, the Fed needs to hit uh, the financial system straight into the face with a fist. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. When today's guest was last on this program back in March, he predicted a lot more instability lay ahead in 2022 than the markets were pricing in at the time. And boy, was he on the money. As we begin to approach the end of the year, it's high time to have him return to share his updated macro outlook with us. I'm pleased to welcome back Dr. Mark Faber to the program. Mark's a PhD in economics, author and longtime editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, Doom Report. Mark, thanks so much for staying up late to talk with us all the way from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Yes, it's my pleasure. And I work at night, so it's not an inconvenience. And to talk to you is a pleasure. So I would do it any hour of the day. Uh, we are very <laughs> kind. Thank you. Well, it's a great honor. And and Mark, we were talking when the cameras were off that, that some of your previous appearances uh, have been some of our best performing videos on this channel. You got a lot of fans here. So I know that they want us just to dive into the material here. So so let's get going. I got a lot of questions for you. There's a lot going on since we last talked. Um, a lot that that validates many of what you sort of predicted when we talked it earlier. But let's start at the usual high level here just for a just for our little reset update. What is your current outlook for the global economy and the financial markets? Well, uh, the financial markets uh, will move according to what central banks will do to a large extent, but also they will move according to fundamentals in the world. I think if I look at the whole world, uh, in terms of economic activity, we have not recovered to the peak that occurred in 2018, 2019. We had recovery moves, but let's say if you look at travel statistics, international travel statistics, in most countries, we're still down very substantially. And if you look at valuations, the valuations are still very high. They have come down somewhat. I have to point this out because, as you know, the S&P is down 22% or 23 this year. And the Nasdaq is down over 30%. And the European markets, if we measure them in US dollars, they're all down around 30 35% and so forth. And the emerging markets, they have been in bear markets for several years now. Now we also have to look at individual sectors and some sectors have performed better than others. But basically what has happened is liquidity in the world, global money supply has been contracting. It's still at a very high level, but it's been contracting. And when this happens, asset prices tend to go down. And we had this tightening mode in the world among central banks. Uh, the central banks were sleeping essentially for 12 years between um, 2009 and 2021. And even in 21, a year ago, they all said, oh, inflation is transitory. Now, we may have to look at exactly the did they do it by, uh, let's say, in, did they do it intentionally or were they so dumb? You know, this is two different things, because if you look at the action of politicians today, frequently you ask yourself, do these characters actually want to destroy the economy or are they simply so ignorant that they take measures that are negative for the economy? This is particularly true in Europe. And it's, it's, I'm not even sure which answer is better. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I agree with you. Both answers are horrible. And then there is a question of corporate earnings. In some emerging economies, corporate earnings have come down, and in some sectors, they have come down. But say for the SP, the estimates 
by our brilliant analysts are still <laughs> up for the year and they're up for 2023. So uh, I ask myself, from my observations about economic activity around the world, which is down, there's no question about this, uh, can the S&P earnings still be up this year and next year, when in fact this year the earnings have already started to decline, but the analysts haven't adjusted yet. And uh, when I see the results of disappointing earnings, say in the case of NVIDIA or in the case of FedEx and stocks tumble to new lows, then I think that this will be a factor that will wait on the markets going forward when the earnings disappoint. And uh, what is not uh, considered sufficiently is the demand destructions, the destruction that is taking place, A, from falling asset prices. You know, the last few years we had this money illusion, everybody got richer who owned real estate, who owned collectibles, art, and uh, stocks, bonds and so forth, because everything was going up. Now everything is going down. And in concert, some assets are going down more than others. But it's unusual. I've been through so many bear markets, starting with 1970 to seven, the end of the 69, 70 bear market, 73, 74. 81, 82, and so forth. Normally, when markets went down, bonds rallied, treasury bonds rallied. Not necessarily junk bonds, but treasury bonds rallied. That was also the case in the Great Depression. But this year, you look at the TLT, this is the long-term treasury ETF. The symbol is TLT. It's down from 18 months ago, from 170 to now below 100. In Austria, the long-term bond is down more than 50%. So there was no place to hide for asset holders. And uh, whereas a very wise hedge fund manager actually runs the largest hedge fund in the world, at the end of 2021, wrote, cash is trash. <laughs> now <laughs> he's changed his tune. <laughs> his tune. So you understand, this has been a brutal decline in asset prices, which will impact the consumption of many people because many people lived from asset price increases. Number two, someone out of Germany just sent me a video uh, an hour ago, and it shows uh, an analyst, he took a basket of goods in the supermarkets from butter, cheese, and so forth, all kinds of items, and soap, and whatever the household needs uh, for the daily life. Altogether, the price over one year had gone up by 39%. Mm. I don't know any wages that go up by 39%. And the pensions don't go up by 39% and so forth and so on. And so the consumption is uh, impaired, is, is shrinking because people don't have the money. Look, I live in the north of Thailand in Chiang Mai. Thailand is uh, famous for the tourism among young people and elderly people, but it's also famous as a retirement country. It's consistently uh, voted as one of the most pleasant countries to retire and to live because the price level is reasonable and so forth. My friend, he owns a restaurant. The restaurant is a French restaurant that is bistro style. It appeals to everyone. It's simple. Outside you can smoke and inside uh, there's no smoking and so forth. I can observe that the pensioners, starting around the 25th of the month, 
frequent that restaurant much less than uh, when they get the pension. They get the pensions usually around the fifths to tenths of the months from Germany, Switzerland, and so forth and so on. So then they have some purchasing power, but not the same as before, because their cost of living has also gone up. But the pensions uh, from Germany, Switzerland, and so forth, in Switzerland, they haven't gone up. I don't live from my pension because I'm a working man. But uh, I, I can tell you, you can ask your viewers. They can all check with their parents who are pensioners or so. All of them suffer at the moment, all of them. And so I think the corporate earnings will begin to disappoint massively. And uh, how do we get out of it? Well, uh, as you said before, there's no easy answer because the two things uh, essentially the authorities can do. Well, there are many things they can do and that it will give you a solution. Uh, one of the things they can do is they could stop increasing interest rates as some people are calling for, including the UN. That is the best joke I ever heard, that the UN is calling for central banks to stop increasing interest rates. <laughs> what is funny about this is it coincides with the UN having concluded kind of a joint venture with the World Economic Forum, as if the World Economic Forum was ever interested in the uh, faith and in the prosperity of the small guy in the mm -hmm. world. <laughs> That's a, it's a complete joke. But anyway, that they can do, they can stop increasing interest rates. Say, in the Western world, inflation is running at, say, between 7 and 15%, depending the, on the household and depending on how many children you have and on your eating habits and so forth and so on. But Interest rates are still, say, in the U.S. at 3%, and in Europe, they're next to zero. In Switzerland, they're at zero. Uh, if they don't increase interest rates, uh, then inflation may slow down uh, temporary, you know, for six months or one year, but it will then go up again. And uh, so you'll get more and more inflation and less and less purchasing power. And this is the problem of inflation. It erodes the purchasing power of ordinary people. It enriches rich people. And you will get a mess, but, but maybe later on. Or they keep on in increasing interest rates until inflation really slows down, but they have to maintain interest rates at a fairly high level for a while. And then uh, there will be pain, especially given the fact we have an entire generation of people, they grew up and, starting, uh, and started working and investing and buying a home in an environment of artificially low interest rates. Mm -hmm. Since 2009, interest rates in the Western world have been far below of what they should have been. But this, is, uh, this has happened because uh, wokeness, the woke culture has also invaded economics. And for a while, a great fashion was to talk about the modern monetary theory. And a great deal of academics, they sort of endorsed this nonsense. I call it bullshit. Because throughout history, governments have gone bust when their debts became overly burdensome. So to claim that the government can borrow endless money is, of course, total nonsense. But this was endorsed. And the worst part of it, the investment community, the fund manager, the strategist, the analyst, they all applauded. 
because these people in the financial sector, including myself, but the people in the financial sector, they benefit from rising asset prices. Their fees go up, the performance fees go up, so they all applaud. They applaud idiots who are sitting in central banks who do these things. And at the end, when it's proven that these idiots in central banks, these morons, are completely wrong, they give them a Nobel Prize in economics. Like today, Mr. Ber ben Bernanke. This is the best joke I've heard in a long time. <laughs> When I saw that, I had to laugh out loud. I figured, I figured that would have really done that for you. Nobel Prize in economics, just like Mr. Obama, you know, the Peace Nobel Prize. <laughs> this is wonderful. All right, Mark. Well, look, I'm, I'm waiting oh, until they, they give the the Peace Nobel Prize to Zelensky or Putin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. It's not, it's not a crazy comparison, I'll tell you that. Um, I, I figured that would really- And, and the Nobel Prize for Chemistry to Hunter Biden. That is a, <laughs> a proposal I have for the world. <laughs> yeah, Hunter Biden or Walter White. Um, <laughs> all right, well, Mark, look, what, what a phenomenal uh, summarization you just gave us there of, of so many of the factors that are driving things right now. I have a question for you. It's kind of multi-part, so let me, let me tell you the parts, and I'll let you determine how you want to attack it. But my question to you is, is, is um, if I can wrap, sort of summarize what you said, it, it sounds like uh, there's a lot of instability in the system today, and it is continuing to dial up. So my question for you is, where do you see the most likely failure points to be in the system today? You know, they could be Financial, you know, we could have some sort of financial instability event, and, and the Bank of England just gave us a little preview. It could be <laughs> economic. We could just yeah. go into a massive a global little preview. <laughs> a little Pardon preview. me. I like the expression "a little preview." A little pre exactly, yeah. Um, so it could it could be economic, <laughs> right? We could, we could go into a, a very bad recession. Maybe some are using the word depression. It could be geopolitical. You know, you just mentioned Russia and Ukraine. It could be resource related. We're just, we are getting, you know, we, we have underinvested uh, in, in CapEx and a lot of key resource-based industries. And now we have, some, you know, global trade getting mixed up by the boycott against Russia and the, the supply chain kinks. Or it could be social. You know, you, you talked about how a lot of what's going on rewards the very, very rich at the expense of everybody else. So where amongst those do you do you personally see the greatest uh, potential for something to, to really break here? Well, I'm sorry to say I see the potential that everything breaks. That they <laughs> that all do. The, okay. All the factors you mentioned break at the same time or in sequences, and then they reinforce themselves on the downside. But say... Let's uh, think about uh, wells. I was listening the other day to someone who, who had been a founder or run, he was running uh, Carlyle. Now, Carlyle is a very questionable company, not necessarily only negatively, but they are tied into the government. That there's no question about this. They're like a Washington establishment, uh, powerful and so forth. And he was talking about the best money managers and uh, you know how to invest and so forth. But I think uh, we could look at periods in history during which actually wells didn't go up a lot and the economy functioned or the economy was growing somewhere. So uh, let's say in the 19th century, we had in the US strong economic growth and strong per capita growth. I was recently interviewed in Switzerland and then they said, well, Mark, you're romantic. You want to go back to the robber baron's day. Hmm. I said, What's wrong with the robber barons? They built uh, the railroads, they built the bridges, and they built uh, the canals, 
and it allowed transportation costs in the US to go down, and it allowed farmers in the Midwest and in the West to produce and then send these goods to the centers of the East. So what's wrong with that? Of course, they abused their power. But please find me a system in history where the ruling class didn't abuse its power. The question is, you abuse your power and you enrich in the, co in the cause everybody else, or you abuse power and you enrich only yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the system, the robber baron system we have today. That's it. But in those days, uh, the per capita incomes of people oh. rose at a much faster rate than they've been rising in this century. And we had recessions one after the other and bankruptcies. And so forth. that's why when Jeremy Siegel, I, I mean, I like him as an individual and I think he's, his theory is basically correct, and I recommend actually people to read his book, that over the long term, stocks perform better than cash and bonds should be clear. It's a logical uh, way to look at it. It's a higher risk to invest your money than to deposit your money. But I told him your statistics, I said to him, Jeremy, your statistics are wrong. Because you start with an index in 1800. Now, I looked at the composition of the index in 1800. There were only canal companies in the index and some banking companies. Okay? Okay. All the canal companies in America, including the very best, the Erie Canal, all of them went bust. But it didn't matter that they went bust. The people could still use the canals. Right. You understand? They had the usage of the canals. The infrastructure was there. That was the crucial point. So people could produce wheat somewhere, put it on a barge, and ship it to New York and so forth. And that uh, created the trade. And one thing I have to say about the US, which I can't say about uh, Asian countries and emerging economies, in the US, we have maybe not thousands, but for sure we have 50 major centers of industry. We have Houston, we have Dallas, we have Los Angeles, we have San Francisco, we have Silicon Valley, we have Kansas City, we have Indianapolis, and then, then, then. In other emerging economies, you go to Indonesia, it's mostly around Jakarta, and Surabaya and Bandung, the rest is mm -hmm. practically nothing. And you go to Thailand, it's the corridor between Bangkok and the south, John Buri, and east, where, eastwards. The, we have uh, handicraft industries in Chiang Mai and agriculture, but no big, really, industries. So this is a huge advantage that arose in the US because they built railroads. And 95% of them failed as well. And but and the canal system, and then they built roads and so forth. So it was a an area, an era of prosperity, and the government was small. That was the ideal of the constitution uh, to keep the central government, the federal government, small. But over time, <laughs> they grabbed more and more power. Uh, that was the mistake of Hamilton, <laughs> who essentially created the national bank and gave the central government the power to tax. They should have limited taxation. The federal government should be limited to 10% tax and no more. <laughs> they kept on increasing it. Which every politician, you know, once they get a taste of that, you know, they never want to get off that train, correct? The problem with uh, politicians is, you know, the Republicans accuse the Democrats and the Democrats accuse the Republicans. I know Democrats who are much more Republican in their mind uh, 
uh, than Republicans. And I know Republicans who are in their mind are much more liberal, much more democratic than say a, a Democrat. I know in Germany, in Germany, one of the politicians I respect is a socialist. She attacks, she recently said, <laughs> we have in Germany, it is a politician, she said we have in Germany, the dumbest government of any European country. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> and I believe the you probably agree with her at this point. My friend immediately said, well, they have a lot of competition for that title. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, look, Mark, so um, I like how you phrase that, which is, you know, what, what made uh, certainly the U.S. so great in its heyday and many other countries is, is we, we had a form of capitalism that resulted in large distributed prosperity and that was coupled with small centralized government now i believe you probably say we we kind of have the tables flipped here where government's gotten much bigger much more centralized and prosperity is 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 not distributed anymore uh and in fact if you look at you know a lot of what's getting investment these days it, it's hard to it's hard to claim that many of these meme stocks uh, many of these MFTs, et cetera, where a lot of the hot speculative money went until recently, really created any kind of long lasting legacy the way that building railroads did or canals, for example. So my question is, is you know, we're already seeing um, a fracture point in, in certain areas where the imbalance is getting so great that the populace has no other choice but to rise up and try to replace the system because it's just not working for people. You live not too far from Sri Lanka, where that happened earlier this year, right? Do you anticipate more of that type of social unrest going forward? Uh, possible, but I want to explain here something that uh, most people overlook somewhat. Throughout history, we had governments, and uh, you know, some people will say, "Well, in Greece, they had a democracy." <laughs> They should read The Republic by Plato. He wanted a democracy, yes, but only very selected, educated people should be in government. This would be a very special class of wise people, of educated people, of dedicated people, of honest people, and so forth. And he wanted, he was very much against the mob rule that everyone could vote. That's the point about the Greek democ democratic <laughs> model. Uh, Machiavelli saw this more clearly. He was not an idealist. He saw uh, the evilness of people, which then also Schopenhauer saw and so forth. But uh, the point I want to make is when a ruler around the world or a feudal behaved very badly, they chopped off his head. You understand? The mm. last one whose head was really chopped off uh, of the aristocracy was uh, Nicholas II in Russia, Tsar of Russia. And uh, the communists socialists that is their that is a typical example of their intolerance that's the thing i object in the socialist ideology the destruction of private property that mm. is the, the 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 ideology is built on that and uh, they killed his whole family you know that is unbelievable by today's standards and uh, but everybody says, "Oh, we like socialism and so forth." They they don't know what socialism brings about, and I can tell you, we have a creeping socialism in the United States. It's not an openly adopted socialist agenda, but say the Greens, they're sort of very left wing. They replace what makes sense, what is practical, what is pragmatic with 
an ideology. They have never really uh, analyzed it. Uh, first, they were against nuclear power. Now I just heard that they are in favor of nuclear power and they are in favor of uh, electric cars, but never mind that you would charge the electric car with natural gas, with the generator, <laughs> all this stuff. And uh, a lot of these uh, environmental measures, they actually require much more energy and are much worse for the environment than if you would just stick to oil. So uh, my view is that uh, we have destroyed, and historically it's been proven, empires don't falter because of wars. They destroy themselves internally from within through internal strive. Yeah. Uh, well, you look, you you are a, a historian and um, appreciate what what the, the the wide scope of history has um, has taught us on this, and has taught us again and again what you just you just said there. And, and, and let's pull that thread just for a second. So, I'm one of the the concerns I've mentioned this channel several times is. Uh, you're right. In the U.S., uh, there is this sort of rise of more, you know, more uh, allure for a more socialist style of governance. And we even have the democratic socialists. That's that's a faction inside the current uh, political system. And, and I think I, 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 something that concerns me is, is I understand the allure of that for especially the younger generations who are looking at a system that has been so taken advantage of now by the the top echelon that so much of of just the the regular american dream is now they see it as unattainable as too affordable and so they feel like it almost doesn't matter who's in power i'm going to get screwed so i may as well vote for the guy who's going to promise me some free stuff along the way right <laughs> you're laughing as i'm saying this yeah i agree with you i mean look a politician, he is faced with the budget. They say he's a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, the government is going to spend this much on whatever. He doesn't care about the deficit, really. All he cares about getting as much money from the expenditures of the government into his state to satisfy his voters. Both the Republican under the Republicans, uh, the deficit has never gone up, uh, never gone down. You understand? They're basically the conservatives, but precisely under them, deficits have continued to go up. The Republicans spend more on the army, and the socialists, the Democrats, spend more on social programs. Yep. Both is bad. Both is bad. Don't ask me which is worse. In my opinion, both are equally uh, this, uh, have a destructive impact on a society. But uh, they are with different views. But what I wanted to add, the problem today is you are a government official. Say you list trusts in England. You can take the worst decisions and... Uh, the worst that will happen to you is you will be replaced by someone else and then you will be uh, taken uh, on the board of some companies. As You'll get a nice cushy board position. Yeah, exactly. You will be elected as, uh, say, the dean of a university or, I mean, somewhere, and you will continue to get your pension and your protection. Y you understand? You can really F up something and still you have personally no risk and the whole government is structured this way so you have cia people uh, in former times if you if stalin didn't like someone who was running the predecessor of the kgb then nkdv he would chop off his head you know, and, and erase <laughs> them from history send him to the gulag these people installed in the first place. But uh, don't expect humans to be nice. 
No, no, and I I agree, Greg. Well, look, and Mark, you know, I could I could continue to pull this thread of 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 you know the the perpetual infallibility and corruptibility of the folks that are running our system, but I got a few other questions for you. So let me let me get to the key yes. one here, which is you talked about how empires end because they essentially crumble from within. Um, Correct. How optimistic are you, if at all, <laughs> that we can sort of pull ourselves out of this sort of devolving uh, situation that, that I, I believe you see in most of the major societies around the world right now? I want to tell you something. I joined an initiative in Switzerland uh, to incorporate in our constitution uh, some articles that would be very crystal clear about Swiss neutrality. At the present time in the Swiss constitution, neutrality is mentioned uh, in two articles, but not specific. This initiative we're launching, and we need to collect 100,000 signatures by people, uh, would specifically uh, uh, address the issue of neutrality. Why mm -hmm. neutrality is better than to be a part of a block of nations. And uh, I've written a week ago, actually about uh, the sniveling brats of Martha Stewart, uh, of uh, Martha's Wineyard, Ma Martha's Wineyard, the island. Because these oh, are very Vineyard. liberal okay. people, you know, they're very liberal people and they always say, yes, we need immigration, we have to be nice to them. But once they have them in their own backyards, they don't like it. Right. And so some people have written about this, I found it so funny. And I went to a high-end school in Switzerland, not because we were rich, but because, uh, because my parents were divorced, but my father had uh, an obligation to send us to a decent school because my mother was behind. Anyway, uh, and all my friends, I already asked two of them. Uh, they are rich and very rich by Swiss standards. They're completely uh, disinterested, complacent, and indifferent. Mm -hmm. You understand? It's I difficult do. to find someone who will expose himself also entrepreneurs in America, you talk privately to an entrepreneur. He's a, say you're running a large company and so forth. You bring up the subject of BLM. Uh, of course, he will not support a bunch of people burning down and looting shops and committing crimes and so forth. That he also realizes. But openly to come out against BLM, he won't do. For, for fear of reprisal of the yes, woke mob. Yeah. For fear of reprisal. And it goes on and on and on. You know, the university professors who, when I was growing up, I was told democracy is freedom and this is a better system than any else, anything else, because we have. Uh, the freedom to speak up, to express our views. We were told in many societies, you can't express your views. But nowadays, a university professor who expresses his own views is frequently sacked because they do not correspond to the policy of the university to their moral standards that they established right now. These moral standards didn't exist 20 years ago and didn't exist 100 years ago and never existed. But these are moral standards that are now kind of invented by some lunatics. Right. And, and I got to interrupt you just for a second, because this, this sounds similar to what you were talking about with communism, where not only did they deal away with private ownership, but you said they, they dealt away with, with independent thought that, that contradicted whatever yeah, the, of course. the communist party line was. Intolerance is the hallmark 
of the socialist ideology. Okay. So if I'm intuiting what you're saying is, is you don't seem like you have a lot of optimism <laughs> about where we're headed because, you know, the way we're governing ourselves both politically and socially feels like it's on a, a downward trajectory that history has said doesn't end well. Well, I'm optimistic about one point. I believe that when the rich people, my friends, who live in Zurich on the best locations and are complacent and completely indifferent to whatever happens because they have money and they don't care. That once their assets are down by more than 50% and they stay down for a while by 50%, maybe, hopefully, <laughs> in my view, very hopefully, I pray for them, they will open their eyes and adopt again some common sense, mm -hmm. which has died nowadays. Recently, someone wrote an article, actually, it is an article from 20 years ago uh, about how common sense has died and been replaced by all sorts of ideologies that don't make any sense at all. It's like in economics, I told you, Bernanke winning the whole prize in economics. You need new standards to give him a Nobel Prize in economics <laughs> for someone who was largely, I'm not saying only, but largely responsible for housing bubble and the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. Largely responsible. Yeah, it's like, uh, I don't know, um, giving... Uh, uh, God, why am I blanking on his name? Who's the uh, the pedophile, Jeffrey um... Epstein? Yeah, Epstein. Yeah, it's like My giving good Epstein friend, like Jeffrey like, Epstein. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like it's like giving Epstein like you know the the you know, <laughs> child's protection award. You know? <laughs> yes, uh, he um, should be in charge of a home for uh, orphans. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, look. So, so you raise and a... have Prince Andrew as a yeah, teacher. as the vice principal. Yes, <laughs> we shouldn't be laughing. This is terrible. But, but you're you're, you're right. It's you were laughing through the tears here. Um, all right. So, what could be interesting here, and, and I'd, I'd love to get your your thoughts on this. I mean, use this as a bridge to get to kind of your outlook for the markets and how people can maybe you know protect themselves a little bit from, from what might be coming if indeed asset prices are going to come down 50% yes. or so. Um, Jerome Powell, I, I'm finding him increasingly fascinating to watch because um, I think many of us were, were no fans of his um, until recent, well, no fans of his, you know, since his, his tenure started, but uh, he has been talking a much tougher game since he is, is, chair got renewed and he actually has been tightening and hiking and, and, and now starting quantitative tightening which is something that central bankers have been loath to do he's been leading the way and he has been direct and i would say so far this year pretty resolute in telling the populace hey look uh don't don't expect me to to pivot anytime soon i'm going to do what needs to be done and he has said this is going to cause pain me, I'm choosing to get inflation under control. That's my top priority. I'm going to sacrifice jobs. I'm going to sacrifice the markets. Uh, I'm going to sacrifice the economy. Now, some of the, the folks in his team are saying, yes, the Fed will even tighten into a recession if it has to. Now, TBD, if he's going to do all this, but is Powell potentially actually pursuing the right course of action here to bring the pain that not only will hopefully undo some of the decades of malinvestment that the Fed is and central banks have helped create, but maybe also begin to wake some of the people up, like you've said, Mark, to say, whoa, wait a minute, maybe we were doing things in a really irresponsible, unrealistic manner, and maybe we need to look at this with a fresh pair of eyes and start doing things a little bit more sanely. Not, I'm not trying to paint Powell as an angel here, but I'm just curious to get your thoughts. Yeah, yeah I, I understand. Uh what you are suggesting uh, about the rhetoric of uh, Mr. Powell is correct. That's what he said this year. He didn't say it last year, 
when uh, a lot of people were attracting his attention to increasing inflationary pressures. Yeah, you and waited way, way too long. Totally uh, agree. I, I want here to introduce an idea which escapes uh, many people. Inflation is always an increase in the quantity of money. Mm -hmm. Okay, we may have difficulties in defining exactly what money is, but say an increase in credit and in money. And uh, then there are symptoms. And the symptoms can be sometimes that if you print money, stocks go up or bonds go up or real estate goes up. Uh, this was observed already by Copernicus in the 16th century, the 17th century, that when you increase the quantity of money, prices go up, but irregularly, because it's like water, it doesn't flow down and lifts the whole level everywhere equally, but the money can flow into one sector. Usually the first recipients of the money are the monetary intermediaries, the banks, the insurance companies, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then it flows on to the public. But as you know, we had uh, big bubbles in uh, emerging markets in the 80s and 90s. We had the gigantic, by historical standards, Japanese stock and real estate bubble, where the palace in Tokyo <laughs> was valued at a higher level than the entire Californian real estate. You understand? <laughs> you get this distortion when money yeah. flows from one corner of the room to another corner. And so the last 40 years, 1981 for bonds and 1982 for stocks, until say 2019 was marked by a steady rise of bonds and stocks. Mm -hmm interrupted by serious corrections, occasionally like 1987 and so forth. And in the case of Japan, an end of the asset boom of the 1989 period. It's never yeah. recovered to that level. Some stocks have recovered, but not the majority. So uh, we had this environment. Now we are moving into an environment, maybe like between 1957, 1958 uh, to 1980 of accelerating inflation and the secular rise in interest rates. Possible, mm -hmm. I'm not predicting here, but say in 1970, when I, I started to work in 1970 on Wall Street, the 10 years treasury bond was yielding 6%. Where are we today <laughs> on the 10 years? We're still below, we are around 4%. Right. And then uh, we arose from 6% to 12 in uh, 1973. And then we fell to six and a half in 1974. And we went up and down, and but we peaked at over 15% in 1981. So, you know, if we don't, I mean, uh, Henry Kaufman, he is the editor of the history of interest rates. He worked with Sidney Homer here. All right, yeah. And uh, he is the grandfather. I mean, Homer was called the grandfather of the bond market. And uh, Henry Kaufman is the true old Dr. Doom about bonds. And then there was another one who was, he still lives, Vojny Lauer. He was at first, he was even more bearish. They called him Dr. Death. <laughs> Dr. Death, okay. What comes after Doom? Death. <laughs> Anyway, Kaufman is now in his 90s, I suppose. He's seen it all. And he, I was lucky to meet him, and we are on friendly terms. I mean, we're not drinking bodies and so forth, but we correspond and we're on friendly terms. He wrote an article not long ago in the Wall Street Journal, uh, an opinion piece, and said, uh, we are in a situation where... 
the Fed needs to hit uh, the financial system straight into the face with a fist to show them the resolution of fighting inflation. And otherwise, if they don't do that, well, then uh, inflation will structurally continue to accelerate irregularly. As I showed you in the 70s, we had huge increase in inflation. Then it came down and everybody said, oh, it's uh, inflation is over. Has been, uh, we, we won the battle against inflation. Then it started to go up again. Right. They were premature. Uh, and, but and this started... happens when interest rates in real terms stay negative. And, uh, you know, John Taylor, he was considered to be a Fed chairman under Trump. He is professor at Stanford. Mm -hmm. I met him a few times. Very nice and modest man. And reasonable and intelligent. He and, established the famous Taylor Rule. Taylor Rule. There we go. Yep. Of course, Trump didn't appoint him because... Taylor is a conservative Fed chairman, but and doesn't print money or reluctantly. But anyway, uh, according to the Taylor rule, now uh, interest rates, the Fed fund rate should be over nine percent. Mm -hmm. You understand they're way behind, way behind. And in England, you said we had a minor accident. What is interesting about the case in England is that I basically support the tax cuts. Never mind, they are for the rich, but I basically support the tax cut. What I do not support is that they didn't include spending cuts. Mm. That is the crucial. You asked me before, what can we do? We need to cut down governments to maximum 20% of the uh, economy. We have them at around 50%. Nothing will work. That I guarantee you. All right. And, and I'm just curious, and, and, and then we're going to have to move on, but I, I, maybe we do another video at some point just about this topic because it's so important. Will we ever do that willingly? <laughs> like, I don't see the, gov the government electing to reduce itself at this point. I think we almost need some sort of regime change. I want to explain you why. I started the discussion essentially by highlighting feudals and kings where you, if they behave badly, you just chopped off their heads and you brought in someone new. Now you can chop off the head of the president. You can chop off the head of the CIA and the FBI, but the organization is still there. Right. You know, it, it's much you bigger than to, one person. You yeah. would have to fire them all. And that is practically impossible. But under duress, when uh, uh, people really start to suffer, that's why I say, you know, we need for the Western civilization, the best is really hardship. I will also be hit. I have assets, I have real estate, right. I have stocks, I have bonds, I have cash. I don't, uh, under normal circumstances, I may say, well, I put everything in cash, but cash is very questionable asset in a crisis. If I can make a terrible analogy here, <clears throat> um, for, for too many people, um, there's, there's, there's two ways to change. Um, you can say, look, if I continue doing what I'm doing, it's gonna have a bad outcome. I should change my behavior today to avoid it. I would say, sadly, that's probably the minority of way that most people change. Um, so let's take the fellow who's got an unhealthy lifestyle uh, most people don't change until they have that heart attack, right? That that pain. Are you talking about myself? <laughs> I'm not talking about the guy who's sitting there smoking a cigarette. But uh, yes. but, but there are a lot of people who yes, who I'm just, a candidate. They, they'll, they'll hear all the advice, but they won't take it because they're so wedded to the way they're currently doing things, and it's only the pain that shocks them up to say, okay wow, I need to do something differently. So to your yeah, point, do we almost need the equivalent of a, an economic you know, coronary to, to finally maybe start thinking of ways to do things differently? Yes, I think uh, we have a generation, they have to go through hardship and then they will think uh, differently. 
I mean, uh, we had the Soviet Union and I went to many countries under socialist regimes in Eastern Europe in the 60s. Actually, the first one we went on a holiday to Yugoslavia in the 50s with my mother. My mother took us on a holiday. Uh, because we were not rich, and so we choose places that were reasonable in price. And it was beautiful, and Dubrovnik in the 50s was wonderful. There were no tourists, uh, and only local people, and so forth. Anyway, so I'm familiar with socialism, and I've uh, been to Russia in 1980, and I saw the hardship people lived under, and I've been to China and Vietnam, and so before they opened up, and I've seen them after they opened up, and how the free markets and the capitalistic system lifted the standards of living of everyone. Everyone. Some more than others, that I agree. But give me a system which is 100% just and fair and fairy tale like we would live in paradise does not exist. In right, my and that's view, why paradise doesn't exist. I'm a, I believe in God, but not in the paradise and the hell tale. But anyway, uh, I think we need hardship uh, to change uh, some uh, behavior in society. I, for instance, when I talk about the importance of the family, people think I'm old fashioned. Well, no, I, I'm a very liberal person, <laughs> you understand? But about certain things, I, I have my beliefs. I believe in God, and I think that the family is a very important unit. Mm -hmm. And I believe personal responsibility is very important in a free society. You don't want to be free. Okay, then uh, you abandon your responsibility and you transfer it to the government. Say to Mr. Biden, okay, if someone wants Mr. Biden to be responsible for his well-being, he's welcome, but not Mark Faber. Right, don't, don't ask you to give up yours. Yeah. What I want to do, and the last thing I would want to be, have as a guardian or as a supervisor is one of these left-wing uh, dictators. You look at Ocasio uh, Cortez and the BLM leaders. Where do they live? How do they live? They don't live according to what they preach. They are the leaders, the chosen ones. <laughs> you understand? And that these people would take my decisions and tell me in my business, you have to do it this way and that way. But this has happened. Many businessmen, small businessmen closed down because the regulations became so harsh and difficult and expensive that they had to close down. Correct. And then there was even just in the the pandemic shutdowns, it was very arbitrary who was deemed an essential business. And in large part, it was smaller businesses that were forced to shut while the big corporations were allowed to kind of have free reign uh, and in, disproportionately. In Thailand, they closed down small business owners, but 7-Eleven was open. 7-Eleven yeah. belongs to essentially, he's maybe the richest man in Thailand or the second or third one, doesn't matter. But it shows it was an, a, the lockdowns shut down the lives and uh, destroyed the savings of many, many people in the world. Yeah, and, and sadly, it seems like uh, at every decision point recently here, if someone had to get tossed under the bus, it, it's been the 99%, it's been the small businesses, the small guy, in your words, and, and, yes. and the big politically connected, you know, yes. megacorps are the ones that are I agree. Running. All right, look, I got to get I got to get to the market part here. I do want to just end this section with a, a, a visual. Um, I put it up on this channel once or twice before, but to me, it just really captures succinctly perhaps what you're talking about here, Mark. Um, you probably heard this before. Um, it's 
it's uh, it says something like, um, uh, what is it? Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. It's sort of the the, the, the <laughs> cycle of society. And it sounds like what you're saying is is you know well, hard to sound like you're wishing for it, but you're wishing for hard times so that we can create some good, some strong well, men. I'm, and then eventually I'm not wishing times. for it, but I'm stating that it would be good. And by the way, I'm, I'm deeply surprised that you are so politically incorrect. You shouldn't say man, strong man <laughs> and weak man. You should say strong human beings and weak human beings because we have to include women <laughs> into this equation. Mark, I, I, I appreciate your, your social correctness. Thank you. <laughs> don't, don't worry, you're not insulting me. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know. I, I know that you're making fun of our, our uh, you know, hyper, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, hyper helicopter society that we live in right now. <laughs> All right, so so folks who have, have been watching are saying, okay, look, um, Mark has, uh, you know, painted a, a relatively gloomy uh, outlook for our current prospects, which maybe isn't a surprise coming from the guy who writes the gloom, boom, doom report. Um, you talked about how, uh, you know, there's there's the potential that um, asset prices could could continue to go down perhaps a lot to finally begin to wake people up here. So the people watching this channel are regular investors. Um, I would say that they're probably in violent agreement with much of what you've said here in terms of your outlook and um, are wondering, okay, uh, how do I navigate then what's coming here? Um, what, what is your market outlook from here? Do you, do you truly think that the bear market that we're currently in is not over or lower prices ahead or do you have a different view? And then can we talk about some asset classes or strategies that you think the little guy might wanna consider in this environment? Yes, I... Our interview with Mark will continue over in part two, which will be released on this channel tomorrow as soon as we're finished editing it. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And be sure to hit the like button too while you're down there. And remember, we're continuing our practice of publishing my top takeaways from these weekly interviews. To get mine from this interview with Mark for free, just go to wealthion.com slash adamsnotes. And finally, if the challenging macro outlook Mark has detailed in this interview has you feeling a little vulnerable about the prospects for your wealth, then consider scheduling a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your wealth, keeping in mind the trends and risks that Mark has mentioned here. Just go to wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you next in part two of our interview with Mark Faber.